a little slowly because it, it's uh, not uh, uh, a simple matter. So let me rewrite. First of all, I replace this with the average and move out. That much is okay. I have to change the chalk because this doesn't write. That notation says that it is the average over the, all the final end states. And what is remaining, let me write the, rema the remaining part of it. D E N rho E N sine squared E N minus E I divided by 2h bar. I hope you can see it in here. T is sort of alpha, so I sine squared. Okay, divided by En minus Ei. That is what I have in there, right? Let me form this ratio so compensate by that. I divided by 2h inside the square, so multiplied it by 4h squared. So what else? x is there. I need an alpha, right? Alpha was t, so let me put the t in here and compensate by the t up. Okay, so that T are to mimic the uh, definition and these 2H and that 4H squared is to make this appearing. So is it, the, is it clear that sine squared alpha X divided by alpha X squared when alpha goes to infinity type of relationship I have made to appear in here? So look at that block, and encircled with the green. So it is indeed that expression. So when t goes to z infinity, in the in the context that I have described before, that becomes pi times delta x is what x is this expression e n minus e i divided by two h bar. Let me move a little bit away so that it, it's visible. So I can copy it here. So what did I get? I get the following. Sum over n, ens, eis are approximately equal. Cn1 squared is equal to VNI squared the average times delta EN DEN rho EN times that delta function pi First of all, there is t over 4h bar squared. We had a 4. We had a 4 beforehand. That 4, let's put that 4 somewhere in here. Good. Those 4s cancels. So we have the t over h bar. squared times what else? The rest is pi times delta E n minus E i divided by 2 h bar. So that is quite clean as it stands. We can finish <coughs> the integral 
First of all, if we remember the scaling property of the delta to be as, remembering this relationship, I can move the 2h bar from inside out. So v and i squared barred t over h bar squared was already here. 2h bar comes out as 2 pi h bar times d e n rho e n times delta e n minus e i. Everything became quite beautiful now. You see it clean. I can carry out the <coughs> integral using the delta which gives me automatically rho e n at e n is equal to e i. You notice that I write it in this fashion for the obvious reason that rho is the density of the final states. If I compute the density of final states, then I equate, evaluate it at the e n equals e, e i value. That's the meaning. If I write it rho e i, you would have the impression that it's the density of the initial states. It's not the case. So let's clean up a little bit. That cancels. So you have 2 pi t over h bar v n i squared the average <coughs> rho e n e n equals e i is the probability which I was computing. You see how nice it came out to be as a result of rather complicated steps. Well, it's not the mathematics which was complicated, it's the physics which is quite involved. We have to really think very hard to include those final states into account. N not decided by the energetics, but we had to we were pushed to include them in. <coughs> okay. Now I would like to uh, move to a different a new concept. It is the transition rate. This is the probability from the given initial i to a group of final n. It's not a from, from a given initial to a given final anymore. It's from a given initial i to a group of final having uh, satisfying the energy conservation relationship. In principle, they are counted by the density of states rho. This one. Number of states per unit energy interval is the definition of the energy density of states. Now I will define transition rate. Transition rate is the probability per unit time. Probability of transition per unit time. So obviously it is easy mathematically to construct based on that definition. We use the W to distinguish from the omega, not to be less not confused. The omega is the frequency, W is the transition rate. So it's going to be D by DT and CN1 squared. That was the probability, that's the time derivative. Obviously if, you, if it is the per unit time, you take the time derivative to get that expression. And you see it's already in a very convenient form. It's linear in time, then nothing else depends on time. So when you take the time derivative, t goes away and you get a constant transition rate. It is something to reflect about, worth to reflect about, because you get a constant transition rate. Irregardless of the uh, well, I don't, I don't want to say anything more because it's already constant potential, right? Perhaps it's, it, was, it was quite natural to get this out anyway. Rho 
En, En, Ei. So this is the beautiful expression due to Fermi. So he calls the people call it Fermi's golden rule number one, and there are other golden rules of Fermi. You see, the average potential squared average and the density of final states entering evaluated at the energy conserving value. And then at this point, I, I have to complement this with the a single to single transition. So this is I to group of final. I use this notation following Sakurai. Of course, we have to do it a little more aesthetically. I is a given initial state and group of final states. Now V say, if there is a single initial to a single final, that's a bit, I know, intuitively clean, but mathematically a rather dangerous statement, I know. We, I will write the result now down, and I'm not going to dwell on it that much. Now there is no more average because we have a single initial to single final. And rho is replaced by the energy conserving delta. Well, there's no problem with the replacing the density of final states with the energy conserving delta. Because if there are many states all having the same energy, it's, it should be re represented here by the density of final states. And the average is eliminated. The, it, it, we remove the average sign because it's single to single. But why do I go through this detour? following the Fermi is that could we, we had the originally an expression which we have naively written as a single to single transition. And we discovered that I didn't really get into detail that much. In that expression there was a dangerous mathematical property that the probability wasn't linear but quadratic. It's a little beyond the level of this class so I, I skip that discussion. So in order to get this linearity, we have properly included the final states and gone through this careful analysis. But now I'm going back to single to single and I say, remove the density of final states and replace it with the drag delta. If you want, and if you spend a couple of hours in some Sunday afternoon, you may wish to read these from different sources. It may be quite amusing. It's correct, of course, what I'm saying, that there is nothing wrong with this. But the logic of discovery of new laws, it may be quite amusing to, to spend a few minutes or a few hours, depending on your speed. So that is a good uh, uh, point to turn our attention the applications. Uh, well, actually, uh, not yet, because there are uh, still a few things that I would like to consider. The, the first one is, I don't know how much time I would like to spend on it, but obviously I have to spend some time is how to include higher order effects. Obviously, this discussion was based on the first order perturbation theory, right? Because if you remember, the perturbation theory is based on this type of series expansion. Well, for the particular problem we have considered for the constant potential, if you start from an initial state i and make a transition to a final state which is different than the initial state. This is zero for n different than i, which simplifies life a lot. And then obviously, if it is the first order perturbation theory, you retain this term only. 
If it is second order perturbation theory, you have to retain <coughs> these two together and then consider the probability by taking the mod square and then go to the transition rate as we have done there. Let me give you a quick sketch of that construction. It's the, that's the second order perturbation theory. Let me compute this one. Second order term. It may cost us about 10 minutes, but let me still do it because you, I don't want you to give the impression as if it is a very difficult thing that we should be afraid of. It is not. So what we have to do now is CN1 is already computed. Let's compute the CN2. And we have, we have the expression uh, minus i over h bar squared. There are double integrals dt prime to t dt double prime to t prime e to the i omega n m t prime e to the i omega m i to t double prime. Remember we have the n to the left i to the right and inside we have vt prime vt double prime we insert an intermediate complete state and then we get those expressions Vn, uh, Vnm, sorry, T prime, Vmi, T double prime is the expression we have to compute for the problem in hand, that is the constant potential V. So for the constant potential, of course, these are time independent. I drop the time dependences. I move these out. And of course I forgot something. I need to have the summation for the complete intermediate states m. So what do I have then? Minus i over h bar squared sum over m vnm vmi the logic of following this is easy, right? Neighboring indices are contracted because you inserted the complete M uh, completeness relationship. For the first factor, M is in the right. For the right factor, M is in the left. So they are neighboring indices. That's only, only very nice. So we then write dt prime to t, dt double prime to t prime. And these are the integrals which I need to carry out. Perhaps I can shortcut a little bit. If you allow me, instead of writing all the details, just move this here. Nm t prime dt double prime integral is to be carried out to t prime. E to the i omega m i t prime. Okay. Well, these integrals are easy. Although the expression was horrendously uh, complicated looking, now you see, again, it boils down to the simple ordinary integrals. Let's carry out this one. This is 1 over i omega m i e to the i omega m i t prime minus 1 because the, the upper value is t prime, the lower value is 0, so that's, that's why it's 1. Minus i over h bar squared move this m omega n m omega m i divided by i time omega m i integral now dt prime to t this integral e to the i omega m i oh sorry I have to write this a little cleanly i 
omega n m t prime e to the i omega m i t prime minus 1. Okay. The first term, of course, they are all t primes now. n m plus m i e n minus e m plus e m minus e i. E M's cancel, so the first factor is E omega n i t prime minus i n m t prime. Well, the first term is nice because the nice thing is that it's the given initial i and final n. But this second term involves that intermediate, infinitely many crowded states. So it, it's going to complicate the life a little bit, obviously, as we expect. So let me finish CN2. Minus I over H bar squared. Sum over M. V N M. V M I divided by i omega m i. Now, the, what is left over? The leftover is the t prime integration. As before, we can do it. As e to the i omega n i t minus 1 divided by i times n i. That much is easy and nice because no intermediate one is entering, but in the second one, the intermediate one is entering. So it is e to the i omega n m n m n m t minus 1 divided by omega n m. Okay. Now let me write the first one first, and I will worry about the second one next. I say worry about because it's something we have to worry about a little bit. Now, i and i is minus, and minus is squared, plus i squared is minus. So minus and minus all together plus, right? Okay, so m, v and m, v m i, Uh, omega h bar squared or h bar let me write rather exotically m i h bar is it m i m i indeed then n i omega n i nice Minus the second term. Let me write the second term without focusing. I will show that it averages out to zero. But the, 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 the first term is the first term is rather clean. Let me explain what do I mean by that. So it is h bar omega n i. So. One e to the omega n i t divided by h bar omega n i times sum, sum over m v n m v m i divided by h bar omega m i. And minus the second term. 
look, let's look at this term and let me remind you the, what was the first term. CN1. Compare. Compare against VNI divided by h bar omega ni 1 minus e to the omega ni t. Remember, turn your page and let's check that expression for the first term. That was the expression we had, right? Indeed so. If you compare this, you see that if it wasn't for the second term, this factor not yet. We, are, we, haven't take, we haven't taken the mod squared. Notice that it is this factor which is the same. So if I write two second order, if I write two second order, I write the following. second order. Cn1 plus Cn2, right? Because n is different than i, so I drop the Cn0. So we have the following. 1 minus e to the omega ni t divided by h bar omega ni times vni plus sum over m sum over m VNM, VNM, VMI divided by H bar omega MI plus minus the second term. That second term I still carry over. But before that, you see a beautiful thing happening. The first term has VNI replaced by that. Uh, 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 with a minus sign, sorry. Let's, what if, let's put the minus sign in here. Okay, that's nice. Because that minus sign will change this to EIM. It's from the MI, okay. So, that's very nice. I now write this entire block as VNI plus M VNM. These signs are so important, so I'm being utterly cautious about this. Now, EA minus EM, EI minus EM. That minus changes to IM. It is EI minus EM. Yes. So if it wasn't for the second term, I will discuss the second term, obviously. So if we drop the second term, which I will demonstrate how to drop, demonstrate why we have to drop it, then the CN1 plus CN2 squared will be just accordingly, sum over n, etc. 2 pi t over h bar, vn i plus sum over m, vn m, vm i divided by e i minus e m 
where the average rho en en is ei. It would be this result. What is the difference from the first order perturbation theory? First order, order perturbation theory is that in, for this matrix element, which we average over the final states, there is a first order term and second order term. That second order term is a beautiful one. So it is the addition. So you see how it is straightforward to take into account the second order perturbation theory. But you see, we have one, uh, uh, although we know the results, so as we knew it, we have gone through with the first group of terms, combine it with the first order perturbation theory to get this, but we have to see why the second term doesn't contribute. So let's discuss that briefly and then we move our attention to something more complicated in time dependence, the so-called harmonic perturbation. But first, why the second term doesn't contribute? See, this, this is the second term. So let me write them down. Second term, y does not contribute. So i and i is minus, minus minus gives you plus, altogether a minus, so it is minus h bar squared sum over m. Vnm, Vmi, Vnm, Vmi divided by Minm, times e to the now minus minus is plus uh, minus i squared is minus plus minus that's a minus if I convert this get rid of it one minus e to the i omega nm nmt So that's this term. Notice that <coughs> these potentials are correlated, obviously, and they are inside. They have N, M, M, I. That's nicely correlated. M, I, N, M. Again, everything is correlated with the M. There is no way of moving anything out of the summation sign. Okay. And here also, this intermediate thing is in. So what is the e argument which uh, enables us to get rid of it? As t goes to, well, we have to take the limit t goes to infinite, right? All these terms are for large t. Now there is the summation m and t goes to infinity and this oscillates ra rapidly. What is the t? Omega is uh, the one over the period, right? When t is very large, this oscillates very rapidly and it vanishes. That's a uh, Borel, Borel lemma. So uh, the, this term uh, gives rapid oscillation which averages out to zero. vanishes for t goes to infinity. For each m, they are under the integral sign. Therefore, when those things, when that vanishes, we have that beautiful second order perturbation theory term. I don't know whether we are going to need this Yes, we are going to need this for eventually for the two-state problem. 
So let me turn my attention now to the new subject, which is the harmonic perturbation. That's a less non-trivial time dependence. Because the first one was very trivial, right? The constant, the sudden jump, and the only time dependence came in at that jumping point, t equals zero. Harmonic perturbation is a very, quite non-trivial. And it is given in the following form, the Vt, which is to be added to the H0, has the following form. This I denote this is with the curly V. Doesn't depend on time, but it depends on everything else. And the Hermitian conjugate part to make this Hermitian. You know, all the potentials that we have to include should be Hermitian, therefore, for example, I wouldn't it wouldn't be sufficient to have this first term only because the first term as it stands is not Hermitian. You take the Hermitian conjugate. This guarantees that it is Hermitian. So let's follow the same steps as we have followed in the constant potential case for this V. Again, consider, again, consider the initial one at t equals zero to be a specific eigenstate of the H zero I and let it evolve in time and let's then ask the question of finding that evolved state in the nth eigenstate of the H0. And then the C coefficients are the right ones which gives you the probability amplitude of finding those states in the nth eigenstates. It is zero again for n different than i. We are focusing essentially on the final states being different than the initial ones. So. And what about the CN1? CN1 as before is minus I over H bar dt prime. We turn this perturbation time dependent potential at t equals zero again as before instead of an arbitrary t zero. So to keep the computation as simple as possible. Okay, this is the first order coefficient. So what we have to do now is substitute this V in here. <coughs> v and I, e, e to the I omega T prime plus V dagger and I e to the minus I omega T prime. We haven't done anything. We have just substituted the V T explicitly and we get what we get the following. Minus <coughs> I over H bar V and I integral zero to T e to the integral t dt prime e to the i omega n i plus omega t prime is the first term. Notice that it became almost, almost exactly the same as the constant potential case because the only difference is omega n i picks an additional piece for the curly v and it picks another additional piece for, for the comp Permission conjugate of it, let me write that down too. Minus I over H bar V and I dagger DT prime E to the I omega N I minus dt prime. The integral is from zero to t. You see, each term 
formally at least, mathematics-wise, has the same form as the constant potential case, but we have two terms. There we have the only single term. So let me carry out the integrations and finish this computation. So what do I have? So 1 over i times the sum of the frequencies, i's cancel, and then I have the following. Vni divided by h bar 1 minus e to the i omega n i plus omega t divided by h bar omega n i plus omega. That's more aesthetical this way, perhaps. And similarly for the second term, V and I dagger 1 minus e to the i omega n i minus omega t divided by h bar omega n i minus omega. Nice. You see how similar these expressions are to the constant potential expressions. Each of them is uh, respectively similar. If you forget the second one, the first one is similar. There, the replacement is omega n i is replaced by omega n i plus omega as compared to the constant to harmonic. And for the second term, the only difference is that omega n i from, from the constant problem is replaced by this one. Apart from these, they have the same form. One was obtained for the constant uh, potential, the so-called constant potential. The only time dependence was a sudden jump at t equals zero. However, they are both here. So life may not be that uh, trivial. You have to be careful. Well, as I said, what you can do is you can just if, to, if you are interested co to computing the probability and the transition rate to first order, then what you have to take is Cn1 squared. And eventually, in order to, be, to take care of every, all the multiplicity of the final states, you have to sum over the n. A straightforward way is to really use the full expression and take the mod squared. Obviously, the mod squared will have the mod square of the first, mod square of the second, and the cross terms, interference terms. So handling those interference terms, of course, at the t goes to infinity limit, may not be that trivial. So we are going to use intuition and analogy. We are going to really focus more closely on the analogy with the constant potential case. Let me qualify what I mean. It said intuitive problems are more difficult to handle than the mathematical problems, obviously. So let me be careful at that point. If, it was, if this wasn't there, if I was focusing on the first term, what would I see if it differs from the constant one by this replacement only then I would have the following figure. So here's the omega n i axis. Here is the omega n i zero. However, that's not the zero. It is the zero of this point, right? Which is important. So I have to go to the minus omega point. So I have to have this infinitely narrow and infinitely thin, infinitely thin and infinitely high peak and little ripples which die off as t goes to infinity. F located at minus omega, that is the zero of this one. If omega n i zero was the principal maximum, it is the zero of this which where the principal maximum should be located. If I am looking at the omega n i axis, it tells me that it should be located at the minus omega. So that is the v term alone. If I was looking at this alone, 
and again get some lessons carried over from the constant potential, I would see that it is the <laughs> zero of this point where I would have the principal maximum located. Omega ni is equal to plus omega. Infinitely thin and infinitely high. That goes to all the way to infinity. T goes to infinity. And again, there would be a secondary ripple which die off at t goes to infinity. It's a delta. And what is the separation between them two omega? And all those ripples died off. So they're well separated. Therefore, the cross terms, that the cross terms will be some ripples and some ripples there. They will never reach each other. Therefore, we have to distinguish two cases. The V type of problems that's a funny language I know I'm using. V type of problems meaning that the energy conservation is this. That is En is equal to Ei minus h bar omega what does it mean? That's the first class, V type of problems. That's the proper figure, right? Which I can write this in the schematic sense. En, that's omega ni plus omega equals zero means en is equal to ei minus h bar omega. And which means the we are in an ei, initial state is ei and it gives away an h bar omega energy out and moves down to the en. This is the emission type of problems. emission. So the curly E, the curly V with the plus exponential gives you the emission, gives away energy. And obviously the second one will be the absorption because it's going to take energy. What is the, how do I, con how do I convert this En, the, the zero that is here located, En is equal to Ei plus h bar omega. I will do it after the break. I will give you the schematic description of it. That is, EI picks, absorbs the incoming energy and moves up to a higher level of energy. And that's V dagger types are absorption and V types are emission. But anyway, let me not write it now. I will do it after the break.